the first 11 verses of the second chapter of John, which is the wedding at Cana in um, Galilee. And I've asked um, Corinne read the scriptures for us. I'll be reading from New King James Version, a Gospel of John chapter 2, verse 1 to 11. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of the wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My heart has not had come. His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing twenty or thirty gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Draw some out now, and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee, and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Amen. Yeah, sure. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for protect, protecting and guiding us today and always. Thank you, Lord, for being with us always. Thank you for your mercies and grace, Lord. Lord, as we have gathered here today, help us to keep our hearts, mind, and ears open. Bless the pastor who will be preaching today. Let this sermon of his be fruitful in our lives. I pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This is a... Um one of the, the great stories, one of the great um, miracles that we find in the Gospel of John. And uh, there is so much to, to learn from John's Gospel, so much to learn from, from this, this particular portion. And um, many times we, we begin and we end um, our scripture reading and, and our, our, our teaching and preaching over the scripture reading are with ourselves. Um, what does this say to me? Uh, how does this bless me? Um, what does it say to us as a church? And even though the, the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation is the revelation of God to man. It is how man was created in the image and likeness of God, how he fell. And then the rest of the, the Bible is, is the story of redemption. It is the story of how God in Christ reconciled the world to himself and then gave us this wonderful ministry of reconciliation. But the problem is if we begin with us, unless we have really studied the word of God and unless we have really studied the attributes of God, unless we've, we've read the right books as well as the Bible, um, there is a danger that we are beginning with ourselves when we should begin with God. That we're beginning with, what does this wonderful miracle 
tell me, does it mean I can work these miracles? Uh, does it mean I can do these great things? Instead of looking, what does this have to say about the Christ, the Son of the living God? What does this have to say about the Messiah? And I want us to look um, and to spend most of our time looking at just one aspect of what this tells us about the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want us to look at the aspect of his sovereignty. The sovereignty of Jesus Christ. And John tells us that this miracle of the turning of the water into wine is this beginning of signs, as Karina read. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. So it's the purpose of, the, of, of, of this miracle was that his disciples should believe in him, put their faith in him, put their trust in him. This was the purpose. And because this was the first miracle, it is therefore of very great interest. This is the first miracle that Jesus did. And in the original Greek, the word John uses for miracle is sign. It's sign. John writes, this beginning of signs, our Lord changes the water into wine as a sign of his glory. And it's very surprising, I think, that any Christian today should doubt or be troubled by the fact of miracles happening today. God is not tied down to his own laws. That's why he operates outside of his own laws with miracles. And we may define miracles in, in different ways. Our director of studies at our Bible school, um, uh, Julian Ward, he described a miracle as something that God completely lays aside natural laws so he would say that a healing a, a healing of cancer he would not have called that a miracle he would call that a great healing because he said that god hasn't laid aside any laws in order to bring this about it is a miracle in the way that he uh you know that, 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 that god then then completely uh, uh turns around the, the illness so that instead of the cancer cells um uh, uh leading to death the the, the, the there, there is a healing but but uh, very often this is a process and so he would only define a miracle he used to say um, a healing of cancer isn't a miracle uh, a man without legs or without an arm growing an arm that is a miracle and so he was very um, uh, uh, strict in in his understanding of a miracle um, other preachers would say that a miracle is when god does lay aside his laws but uh, they would include great healings as miracles they they would take that slightly different so when we talk about miracles uh, you know even great theologians and, and great um, teachers don't always agree on what a miracle is and what a miracle isn't but one thing i will say god is not tied down to his own laws and that doesn't mean that he can uh, make two plus two equal five or anything like that um, because he has a nature and he doesn't go against his own nature he doesn't change his nature and so um, God's nature is good so the you know the argument could God do evil is a ridiculous ar argument because he would not go against his own nature but he can and does sometimes 
uh, go um, not against his, his own laws, but he's simply not tied down by his own laws. He can he can uh, you know he can stop time even though he exists outside of time. He can stop our time for 24 hours, for example. God is the sovereign creator, and the fact that here. In this miracle, our Lord chose to turn water into wine as a sign to us of his glory should not trouble us, and it certainly shouldn't surprise us. If we believe in an almighty, eternal God who is above everything, who is completely and absolutely sovereign, who is completely um, omnipotent, you know, you, you know, I mean, he, he's just omnipotent. You know, it's a, it's it, 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 it is one of, it's an attribute. He's absolute in his omnipotence. He's absolute in his knowledge. He's absolute in his wisdom. He's absolute in his love. He's absolute in his justice. And so we have to believe that if God is almighty and eternal, there's no limit to what he may do. There's no limit to what he can do, except he will not go against his nature. It's true that God normally chooses to, to act in ordinary, orderly manner. But when it pleases him, he may give some manifestation of his glory and his power in an unusual and an exceptional manner. That is what we mean by a sign, by a miracle. And that is what we see so gloriously in the life of Jesus Christ. It is through these miracles that our Lord gives the signs which show that he is indeed the Son of God. And the reason for this miracle, um, apart from the fact that he did good, apart from the fact that he saved the embarrassment of, um, of the, the organisers of the wedding, the family of, of, of the bride and groom, and particularly the, the bride and groom the, themselves, he did all that. But the reason for this miracle was that he would manifest his glory and his disciples believed in him. His disciples believed in him. It's through these miracles that our Lord gives the signs which show that he is indeed this son of God, this exceptional, this unique person, Jesus Christ. The miracles are evidence of his person and his Godhead. He doesn't do miracles um, just for fun. He doesn't do miracles um, you know, at our bidding. The miracles of Christ always had a purpose, always had a real meaning. And God help the so-called healing evangelist who, who turns his meetings into some kind of magic tricks. It's disgraceful, it really is. And so here at the wedding in Cana, we see the first sign that our Lord ever gave. And it's a miracle in the realm of physical creation. God has created this physical miracle. God is an orderly God. Um, many of you come from countries where there's really only uh, two seasons. You know, there's the, there's the dry season and then there's the wet season. You know, you, you have 30 degrees all the way through. You know, I, 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 I look and I always look at, uh, at Manila, si uh, Singapore and, uh, and Bangkok. And Bangkok is about four degrees hotter than, uh, than Manila and Singapore. Uh, sometimes uh, Manila is two degrees uh, warmer than Singapore. Sometimes Singapore is a degree warmer than Manila. But it's always, you know, 30, 31, 34 in Bangkok, 35 in Bangkok, 31 in Manila, 29 in, in, in Singapore. And it doesn't seem to change for the whole 12 months. And, and I see this. So, uh, and so you probably have two seasons. You have the, you have the, 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 the sunny season, and you have the rainy season, but you don't have the cold and the warm season. You know, you, you have these two 
um, these two seasons. Um, in Norway, but you have like uh, uh, four seasons, you know, and, and two of them are long seasons. Um, that are the two winter seasons. No, no, there's a winter season, you know, and hopefully there's this summer season, and then there's a very quick uh, spring, and, and sometimes a quick autumn, and suddenly it's got cold again. And when I lived up in the north of Norway, um, the, the, the spring was about two weeks. You know, we had this long, long, long winter, and then you get to, to kind of April, May time, and, uh, and the snow goes, and there's this horrible brown island, especially when I, I lived on Hadsal, you could really see it. I lived on an island, and it's brown, and it, it really doesn't look very nice. And within two weeks, there's a miracle. It's green, there's yellow flowers and blue fl flowers and pink flowers, and, and the island has just turned into a paradise. Um, it's, it's good that um, uh, it, it doesn't last that long because otherwise Norway would be terribly overpopulated. But it's a glorious paradise. So we have these seasons, we have this, this order that, that God has given us. And in England, you have the, you know, it's almost like a clock. You have winter, and, and winter has to end on, on, the, on, on the 10th of March or something. And then you have this, uh, this beautiful spring, sometimes it's before that, sometimes it's in February. And then you have this summer, um, maybe wet, but uh, warmish wet uh, and then you have the order and you would, and so you you have these these seasons and it's this it's a miracle in the realm of the physical creation and god has placed these seasons to produce our food and our drink and our harvest of food is a picture of god's love and provision for his own his whole creation his own creation but here we see um a miracle in that um suddenly god through the Lord Jesus Christ, God in Christ, um, creates this wine out of water. So there is a miracle because, you know, you can, you can keep water for as long as you like. It, it's not going to ferment and become wine. So there is a miracle where God is actually uh, you know, changing his own laws of his own physical laws of creation. But also he turns this into, into um, wine, into the best wine. And we also have a harvest. We have this wonderful harvest of, of, of food, harvest of fruit, harvest of, of vegetables. And, um, and this is also a miracle of God. It's just that uh, it's much more noticeable when Jesus um, creates wine out of water. But uh, every season is an absolute miracle. Um, and as I said, I lived up in, in Finnmark in, in the north. And, and when that winter hit, I mean, surely nothing could survive. Nothing could survive. And yet when spring finally came and you would get these, these, these wonderful flowers shooting up out of what seemed to be an absolute ice wilderness. We have the same thing in the desert. In, 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 in some of the deserts, they can go two or three years without any, any real rain and you would think nothing could survive. And then suddenly they get a real rainstorm and, all, and so overnight it just becomes an abs absolute picture of, uh, of beauty as um, all these wonderful flowers and, and, and plants grow out of what seemed to be the impossible climate. And so God has given us this, this sign, this, this blessing, showing that, um, that uh, he is our creator. He created heavens and the earth, created man in his image, created all the animal and plant and vegetable life. But there's an even greater creation, and, um, and that is that uh, God has created us to have his spirit. We have his spirit. We, we are not just physical beings. We are not just like apples and, 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 and iguanas and, and, and mice and, and, and snakes. I don't like snakes. Um, but, you know, we, we have the Holy Spirit. We have, we have, we have the spirit. And, and we also have a spirit that is in us that isn't in the other animals. Because as, as marred and almost destroyed as our original spirit is... It is still there. 
It is still there in every man, in every woman. There is still this spirit that, that we have, that, that God has, has given us. The, it's the spirit of man. And you know, we, we have eternity in our hearts. The, 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 the word of God says that man has eternity in his heart. And I believe that even the, the most uh, avid um, denier of God, the most avid denier of uh, of, uh, of, of, of God, of Christ, um, uh, they still have this, this understanding somewhere really deep that they are created for eternity. Because even non-believers, they, they think it's so unfair when somebody dies young. It's so unfair when a life is taken away. And I was just, I wasn't really uh, listening to it, but uh, um, there was a program with David Attenborough, the, you know, the, 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 the English um, uh, naturalist, you know, naturally he's very keen on animals and, 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 and the, the earth and, and everything. And, and he doesn't believe in God. But he was asked the question, you know, uh, you know d does he deny the existence of God? And he said, I can't. I can't deny the existence of God. I, I cannot say with all my heart that God doesn't exist. Because every one of us has this spirit. And the, the blessings of the spirit in the Christian, in the born again man, the blessings of the spirit are so much greater. So much greater. And we are created for these spiritual blessings we're created to enjoy this earth we are created to enjoy the fruit of this earth but we are also created for something much greater and that is we are created to receive the blessings of the spirit as i said we alone amongst creation are spirit i i love animals i I love dogs to, 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 you know, to a certain extent. I like dogs. Um, I like to see Desiree when she puts her pigs on, uh, on her Facebook. She's always putting her pigs on her Facebook. I hope she doesn't eat them, but uh, maybe, maybe I, I, I won't ask that question. And, uh, you know, and I love cats more, more than anything. But, you know, my cat, as far as I know, doesn't worry about eternal life. Uh, I don't think, I, you know, I think my cat just, just, he's born and he's all fluffy and, and lovely or she's lovely and fluffy and, you know, and she lives for 15, 13, 15, 17 years. I had one female live to 18 years um, and, then, and then they just die. And, but I don't think they're expecting anything else. Um, you know, of course there's a question, will there be cats in heaven? I don't know. Um, I, I, but it's going to be a wonderful creation and cats are wonderful uh, creations so I'm hoping there'll be cats in heaven um, you know, but that, that we, we can agree to disagree uh, the, the answer is I don't know okay. but, but you know if, if ever you have someone who's really seeking the Lord and really really seeking salvation and they're worried whether their dog is going to heaven don't say no your dog's not going to heaven ok it's not worth it you don't know anyway because there's going to be a wonderful there's going to be a wonderful new creation in in heaven I, I, it's not worth it's not worth it you don't say to someone that really seeking really wanting to know Jesus. That, that can come later when they're stronger in in their faith okay but we alone our spirit we alone are created in the image and the likeness of god we alone are created to enjoy god forever and we are meant to share the life of God. We're meant to be partakers of the divine nature. Christ came to bring all this to us. And we do not stop 
merely at this miracle of water being turned into wine we see more than the natural blessings of this miracle that's why we 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 don't deny miracles to today we believe in miracles for today because god is a miracle working god and every every um every salvation every person who is redeemed and and, and born again that is the greatest miracle that god can ever Ever give us and but and we don't stop merely at the miracle of the water being turned into wine we see more than the natural blessings of any miracle because it's a sign and it's a sign of something greater we do see in this passage water turned into wine but we see also I hope God's glory we see also the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ our Lord is doing this so that we can see who he is and what he can do for us this the first sign Jesus did that his disciples would believe in him and that is what God wants us to do he wants us to to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as his own people, this must be the way in which we look and the way that we consider miracles, and particularly this miracle. To approach our Lord's miracles from a spiritual point of view does not mean that we forget the physical and the material blessings. We thank God for all his gifts to us. But the question we have to ask is, do we know something of this abundant life that our Lord came to give? The reason that he did this miracle, um, they, 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 there were many reasons. Um, he saved the wedding. He saved the blushes and the embarrassment of the wedding family. He would have brought joy to the bride and the bridegroom. It was a joyful occasion, uh, an occasion where, it, because of the culture of the time, um, was, was, was in danger of, 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 of being spoiled. And our Lord comes along and he saves the day, as we say in English. But there was a greater reason. It was that his glory would be revealed and that his disciples would believe in him. And the question that we have to ask is, do we know something of this abundant life that Christ came to give us? Because Christ said, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it abundantly. I, I like um, the, the version of the Bible that I grew up with, and that was, I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. And this portion of scripture begins with these words. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. That's John 2 and verses 1 and 2. So Jesus is there. He is there. And the most important thing for the disciples was not so much what Christ did for them, not what he enabled them to do, but he himself, who he is. The Apostle Paul emphasises this importance in Philippians 3 and verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. I like the, the O there. All oh, that I may know him. That's what Paul wanted to do. He wanted to know Christ. This is what Paul wanted. Not the miracles so much, but the presence of Christ himself, that I may know him. He said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It wasn't the all things that were important to him, but it was the Christ who strengthened him. He said in Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ. It is always Christ that Paul wants. It's always the Lord. It is always to know him, to know more about him. That is more important even than these mighty miracles. And it must always be that it is Christ that we want. What is your relationship? What is my relationship? What is our relationship to Christ at this moment? 
we look at him as he appears to us in John 2 at this wedding and we should see the majesty of his person above everything. The miracle is that yes, in Romans 8 verse 3, he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. He has been working as a carpenter. He has certainly not had, we believe, the usual training given to teachers and leaders and, and, and rabbis. Yet whenever he appears, our Lord dominates the scene. He stands out. Now we are not meant to stand out. Even when we proclaim, we are to proclaim Christ and his glory. And when we begin to stand out, and when we begin to think we are something, think that our words are something, we must remember John who said, he must increase and I must decrease. Because wherever Christ is in the New Testament, wherever Christ is in Matthew, Mark, Luke or John, he stands out. Even when he doesn't intend to, even when, uh, you know, even when he goes as a, as a guest at a wedding, he dominates the scene. He stands out. And Christ must always stand out. Christ must always dominate our lives and our churches. Mark tells us in Mark 7, 24, he could not be hidden, even though he wanted to. He, he, he tried to, 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 to shield his glory. He tried not to be the popular preacher. He tried not to be the, the, the idea of a redeemer, of a messiah who would be a conquering messiah. And he said to so many people, don't tell. Go home, but don't tell. Now and again, he would go, say, go home and tell. But very often, he tried to shield his glory because his time had not yet come. The moment of his glorification, which magnificently and remarkably was the cross, was the suffering, was the nails, was the blood being shed. That was his glorification. He could not be hidden. He comes anonymous and unknown in a very humble manner to this wedding and in many other situations. Yet in spite of this, his glory just keeps on breaking through. It keeps on shining through. The next thing we notice is this mystery about him. He was born of the Virgin Mary. He is the son of Mary and truly a man. And yet he does not address Mary as mother but as woman, um, something like our modern lady, that sometimes sounds a little, a little bit more respectful, um, but very similar to, 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 to lady. In John 19, 26, when he's hanging on the cross, he said, woman, behold your son. And after calling his mother woman, our Lord says to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? And then he says, My hour has not yet come. He says to his mother, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? What does this all mean? There's only one, I think, adequate explanation. He was fully aware of his messianic purpose. He was fully aware that he was the Christ. He was fully aware that he was the son of the living God. And he was fully aware that his mother, as wonderful and meek and mild and, and what a wonderful example she is, is mere flesh and blood. This should help us to understand and to give Mary her right place in the church. I think the um, evangelical church and the Protestant church, in order to, as it were, to, to spare Mary uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the deity and the sinlessness, that sometimes we've gone too far and she doesn't get a mention. 
She was specially chosen of God. She was such a young woman, bore such a heavy burden, with such grace and dignity that she deserves the same respect that we give to so many of our heroes in the Bible. I can understand us why we want to do that. We, we do want to uh, avoid the errors of the Roman Catholic Church and, and, and other churches of, of, of deifying Mary. And I think this is very clear here. Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? I'm, I'm not like you. You are my mother and you are special and you will always be special. But as regards deity, as regards honour, as regards glory, what does your concern have to do with me? My, my hour has not yet come. Our Lord knows who he is. He knows why he has come into the world. Christ realises that he is one set apart, a man like us in all ways, yet without sin. That is the difference. But he is also God. That is the difference. Set apart from his mother. Set apart from us. Set apart from his disciples. This is the miracle and it's the marvel of Christ. And it is a blasphemy today. If ever you have ever seen some of these preachers who preach the little Jesuses, you know, we're just like him. We are little Jesuses. We're just, we are not like him. We are wretched sinners who are saved by the grace of God in our Lord Jesus Christ. By grace we have been saved through faith. And it is not our own, not our own works, not our own glory. And we have to have this, this separateness, this otherness between Christ and the church, between Christ and us. It is really um, another um, error. Um, you know, Sasha was, was, was in about this, you know, uh, give an inch and I take a mile. Uh, you know, and, and it's just one of these errors that is lowering God and lower, not that you can do it, please understand me. But, you know, man is trying to lower God and raise man until there is little difference. And there's a lot of preaching about that today. There is an ocean of difference and that isn't enough you know we're talking about quality here we're talking about deity and humanity and even when we have our glorified bodies and we see him and we are like him we will never be him we will always be worshiping god always be worshiping the christ even though there is going to be this, 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 this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful truth in heaven that God has made us, recreated us, we're born again. We have the nature of God in us. God has, he's arranged it, created it, done it, redeemed us through it, so that mankind will be as close like and as near to God as is absolutely possible yet without being God I don't even know what that means because there are things that are mysteries in the word of God and many of those mysteries um, actually are about our redemption and our glorified bodies and our eternal lives but he knew he was set apart I love the words where Christ identifies with us and yet there is this, this, this distinction. In John 20 verse 17, one of my, one of my I, love this, I love this verse. I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And he didn't say, well, well, disciples, well, lads, I'm descending to our Father. I'm descending to our God. Uh, our God. No, he wanted to make this, this, this wonderful inclusion and yet this glorious distinction. I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. He's my Father because I am deity. I am also God. I am the second person of the Trinity. But also now, 
He's your father. He's your father. I'm ascending to my God of whom I am like in every way because he who has seen me, seen, seen me has seen the father. I and the Father are one. I am God. The Father is God. The Holy Spirit is God. And I am ascending to my God. But to your God. And I, I love that. In John 8, 23, there's another distinction. You are from beneath. I am from above. You are, the, 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 you are of this world. I am not of this world. And, and the, the more different Christ is to us today, the more unlike Christ is to us, the more glorified we are going to be. Because the difference between you and I here today and you and I with Christ in heaven is going to be enormous. And so there has to be this separateness. He is unique. He is separate. Christ is in the world. He is one of us. He is one with us. He's truly man. And yet he is much, much, much more. And that is a mystery. But it is a wonderful mystery. Because I want my Christ to be unique. I want my Lord to be separate. I want him to be so different from me. Because I'm not satisfied with me. I never have been. I never will be. But I know that there is something that lies ahead which will glorify us and raise us up and also set us apart. But he will always be God. And we will never be God. But we will be glorified. He shares in our ordinary human relationships he he does have a mother and yet it is a very different relationship to everyone else and then we notice another very important thing about him he has an intimate knowledge of us he knows our very thoughts our desires and our imaginations at the end of this chapter we're told very clearly in verses 23 to 25 of john 2 23 to 25 now when he was in jerusalem at the passover during the feast many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did but jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men and had no need that anyone should testify of man for he knew what was in man he knew and he knows what is in man and here his mother comes to him and says they have no wine and immediately he knows what mary is thinking about and jesus gently rebukes his mother it's a gentle rebuke i think you know very often it's how we say something that's important than what we say we can say the same thing exactly the same thing in two different tones one offends the other comforts and i don't believe that he that christ was angry in in you know maybe as god but not angry as we get when he said woman which also means lady which is a sign of respect what does your concern have to do with me and this could be you know, very terrifying, it, 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 you know, it, it's a rebuke, but there is another sense in which it's also a great comfort to all believers. The blessed Son of God, he knows us individually, he knows us completely, and our Lord knows all about us, our fears, our cares, our problems, our anxieties, everything that passes within us. Everything that we think or do or imagine are all open to him. That could be very, very frightening. But the reason this truth should be a comfort to us is because Christ cares about us. Christ is concerned about us. The Lord was concerned about his mother. He did want his mother to have the wrong idea. He wanted his mother to understand. He wanted his mother to understand doctrine. He wanted his, his mother to understand fully the person of Christ. And while she considered Jesus just to be her son, she would never be able to understand fully that he is the Christ. And so he corrected his mother as he corrects us. But it's always for our good. 
It was always for the disciples good. When, 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 when Jesus said to the disciples, how long am I going to be with you? Oh, you have little faith. You know, have you learned so little? It wasn't because he wanted to put them down or, re or, 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 or rebuke them without cause. It's because he knew that these men in just months, months to come would be leading this mighty revival wind of Christianity as the church is birthed and then it just bursts into flame and, 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 and it just becomes this, this, this movement that nothing can stop. And so even when he was rebuking his disciples, it wasn't so they would feel bad. It was so that they would understand who he is. You see, they didn't understand who he was. And, and if the disciples didn't quite understand who he was, his mother, who you know, had, had, had the, the, the Christ at her breast, and, and his mother, you know, who brought him up from a tiny, tiny, tiny... But I believe Mary must have had some of the greatest faith that any woman could have ever had. Think of giving birth and then feeding and clothing and changing uh, your, your son, but he's also God. It must have taken an amazing faith for Mary to let go and to really understand that when she was 16 and became pregnant with this, this, this wonderful child, and even though you know, she, she had the, the wonderful blessing and the wonderful promises of, of God, it must have been a tremendous faith that she had. It's always for our good. So he corrects Mary, he encourages her, and full of encouragement. Mary now speaks to the servants and says, with wonder, I believe, and amazement, but also a new faith, whatever he says to you, do it. What, whatever he, he tells you to do, do it. I don't understand myself. Uh, you know, this, this is just a paradox, it's a mystery. I feel so humbled, I, 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 I feel so scared. But I know one thing, he's not just my flesh and blood. Whatever he says to you, do it. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. We are taught to pray and bring everything to the Lord, but we must never direct or command our Lord. And Mary was saying, in essence, although she didn't mean it, because, you know, because we, if we don't know who Christ is, if we don't know who God is, we will lack humility. We will lack understanding. We will lack wisdom. We will make big, big mistakes. But thankfully, God loves us and forgives us our arrogance and our pride at times. And so Mary is saying, they have no wine. And, 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 you know, she didn't just, this wasn't just something, uh, you know, a, a passing, you know, uh, they have no wine. By the way, what should we do this evening? No, this was, this was they have no wine. Uh, uh, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> they have no wine. You know, it's like when people, uh, if you're a youth leader or, um, or if you ever become a pastor, there'll be times when people will say, you know, um, uh, you know and, and, and it's what, you, what are you going to do about it? You know? <laughs> what are you going to do about it? They have no wine. We must never presume upon our Lord. We must never demand or dictate to him. We must never demand or claim things. Our Lord is the sovereign saviour of mankind and he deserves the utmost respect. He's the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who died on a cross to save us from eternal damnation. So we never come into his presence and say, Hi Jesus. Our Lord is the sovereign saviour. He's the saviour who knows when to act and, and, and what to say and what to do in every situation because he is the sovereign Lord. He knows his own will and he knows what is best for us. And we all made those mistakes thinking we know best. And everything he does is for his own glory. And yet, there isn't the slightest sense of pride or arrogance or wanting this or wanting that 
because no one throughout all eternity has had the humility of our Lord Jesus Christ who took the servant's place who allowed himself to be questioned and misunderstood by even his own beloved disciples who, who, who was denied three times by, by, by one of those he truly loved and Philippians um, chapter 2 says all this one of things about ab about uh, you know that he he humbled himself and became obedient to death on the, cro the cross and yet everything he does is for his own glory everything he does is for his own perfection everything he does is within his own attributes and yet he doesn't forget us even though he does everything for his own glory it is for his glory that we are saved. It's for his glory that he loves us. If, he, if he'd looked at us the way we would look at, at ourselves, he would just see fallen mankind. He would just see pride and arrogance and, 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 and depravity and wretchedness. And yet, he loves us. While on this earth... And in our earthly body, we must leave ourselves in his hands. And it's not easy always to do that. Mary saw that. Our Lord did rebuke her. He did say to her that, uh, what does your concern have to do with me? But... He didn't just stop there and not do anything about it. He, he did. He did the miracle. He did what Mary asked for. He did what the wedding needed. But he did it in his own way. And he did it out of his own nature. He did rebuke her. But he didn't say, well, I'm not going to do anything. What he said was, I'm not going to do it because you demand it. My hour has not yet come. Our Lord did it, but he did it in his way and in his time. Sometimes our Lord refuses to do things when I want him to. Sometimes, haven't we all been there? And this is what, why it's so great to have the Psalms. How long, Lord? Why me, Lord? Why, Lord? When, Lord? How, Lord, how are you going to do it? Sometimes we feel abandoned. Sometimes we, we, we feel that uh, we're crushed. But he will do it in his way and in his time. And we can be thankful that when our Lord rebukes us, his own, there is always comfort and encouragement. That's how we know the difference between the voice of the Holy Spirit, the voice of Jesus, and the voice of the devil. Because when the Lord rebukes us, it's always for our good. It's always for our encouragement. And it's never for our condemnation. The great prophet Isaiah gives great comfort here in Isaiah chapter 30 verse 18. Therefore, the Lord will wait. That he may be gracious to you. Therefore, the Lord will wait. That he may be gracious to you. And therefore he will be exalted that he may have mercy on you for the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for him. That is a lesson we can learn from this first miracle. Blessed are all those who wait for him. We know that he has the power. We know that he has compassion. We know that he has the ability. We know that he has the authority. But I don't always have the patience. Blessed are all those who wait for him. Let us take to our own hearts the advice Mary gave to the servants. After the Lord spoke to her. Whatever he says to you, do it. Whatever he says to you, you do it. Simply be obedient and wait for him well I think we'll, we'll close that there we didn't get on to what it says about us 
and, and what our attitude is to be, but we'll maybe come back uh, to that uh, next week. But um, this is the first sign, it's the first miracle that Jesus ever did. And he did it for his own glory. He did it out of his own sovereignty. He knew what was in man. He did not need man. He did not need anyone to help him. He did this for his own glory. And yet, it's not a selfish glory. That's what the difference between his glory and my glory. Oh, if I could be glorified on this earth, I would be so full of self. I would be so full of self-confidence. I would be so full of pride. But the Lord did it for his glory. But it didn't stop there. He turned water into the best wine available. Plentiful. He saved people's shame and embarrassment. He gave from his abundance. He corrected his mother, and yet at the same time, he just gave another little glimpse, another little sign, another little uh, uh, extra understanding of who he is. That, of course, you're not just my son. You're not just my flesh and blood. And I find that so hard as a mother. Because I loved you with a mother's love ever since but but now i'm beginning to understand that you have another purpose that this miraculous birth that i'm so honored to be blessed by god with is for something outside of me something outside of the family something outside of humanity and now i understand a little bit more now I'm encouraged. Now I have, the, I have that faith. And I, can, I have so much faith now that I can say to these simple servants, not disciples, not religious leaders, but these simple servants, whatever he tells you to do, just do it. And they did it. And the wedding was blessed. The parents were blessed. The bride and groom were blessed. The family party was blessed. The servants were blessed, the disciples were blessed, they believed on, the, on him. Everyone was blessed. So sovereignty and lordship, deity in the hands of God is not to be feared, not to be <laughs> become jealous over, not to be offended over. Because only good will come from such a God. Only good will come from such a Saviour. Yes, he turned water into wine and saved a wedding. What a, a wonderful act of mercy and love. But just a short while later, he will be hanging on a cross with the greatest sacrifice and the greatest love ever shown to man. Father, we thank you for this Saviour. Father, we thank you for this God. Because this Jesus, this God, is our God. Father, we thank you that we could have never known you. You would have always been a mystery and a terror to us. But we thank you, Father, that in your perfect will and your perfect plan, you sent the word of God to become flesh, to become mankind, to change water into wine, to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to bring so much comfort and mercy and joy to so many miserable sinners, to bring miserable sinners to being glorified saints, and we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you went to the cross and you hung on that cross. And far from thinking of your own mother as woman, far from wanting to offend her, Lord, you gave her another son, John. And we thank you that you thought of your mother on the cross as you thought of her throughout your life. 
And we learn today, Lord, that even your rebuke, as it was to Mary, as it is to us, is for our good. So that, Lord, we would be more blessed, more understanding, that we would be able to trust you as Mary trusted you and said, whatever you tell the servants to do, we are to do it. We thank you. In Jesus' precious name, amen.